Hello, pod people. I'm DA, and welcome to Millennial Edition. Thanks for joining us. In this episode, we will be discussing the definition of racism. Remember to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Twitter to be a part of the discussion. Okay, so let's dive right in. Today's questions come from Chris Flores. Um, so if you follow him on Twitter, it's at CFloDadon. So for all of the listeners, let me give you kind of the backstory for how we got here. So for all of those who follow the rapper and activist Talib Kweli on Twitter, as many of you know, because he is a strong, outspoken activist in the Black community, he attracts a lot of racist trolls. You know, just side note, I highly recommend you following his account for no other reason than his clapbacks are hilarious. You will certainly be entertain. Well, one particular troll called him a racist, so I began asking the troll what he understood the definition of racism to be, because it was clear that he was distorting and misusing the word. Not a big shocker, racist troll never defined the term racism. However, our dear friend Chris had some thoughts on it. Chris was initially having a, you know, a back and forth with the troll and was trying to argue and kind of set him straight, but then something changed in Chris's response. In the heated exchange, Chris called the troll a white boy and then confirmed that the term white boy was meant to be racist and he apologized for it. And this is where the conversation took a whole left turn. A couple of us, you know, including myself, commented that the term, no matter how he really meant it, cannot be racist because there is no history in the United States demonstrating that this term was a part of a system of oppression designed to lower the dignity of white people. And Chris, well, I'll just read some of his responses. He stated, in quote, that anything can be racist applying in Ten, end quote, and that, end quote, just because you don't have an agency doesn't negate a person from being racist, end quote, and that, end quote, a person of color can be racist to believe otherwise is inherently racist, end quote, and that we were, end quote, a bunch of black racists trying to minimize the brown experience and acting as if your ideals are the supreme way of thinking. Black supremacy feeds the same devil as white supremacy, end quote. So after a week of discussions, and yes, you heard that correctly, this conversation has now dragged on a week, and everyone online attempting their best to explain why the term didn't quite make sense by his usage, I suggested Chris watch Ava DuVernay's The 13th documentary on Netflix because perhaps it might help provide some insight, and that if he did watch it, then I would do a special podcast episode should he still have questions, because my fingers were getting tired and the conversation was somewhere in the week spinning around in circles. So Chris watched the documentary and big shocker, he didn't feel it answered his questions. Of course he had more. And so now I must fulfill my end of the bargain. Okay, so here is my best attempt at what I and some others were trying to say, Chris, okay? So let's begin with some definitions so you know what I am working from. I definitely understand where the confusion stems from around the word racism. Dictionaries define the word in the most basic and simplified manner. And I am not arguing against this definition. So they define racism basically as prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against someone of a different race based on the belief that one's own race is superior. Very basic, pretty straightforward. I notice, and I do this as well, that when a situation occurs, we use words like bigotry, racism, or discrimination interchangeably. And I don't think there is anything particularly wrong with that. They are all interconnected with each other. However, somewhere along the line, very smart people like historians and sociologists and experts who actually study racism didn't believe that the dictionary definition of racism really captured what racism was and thus provided more insight on the word. The reason understanding the definition is so important is because you will never really be able to combat racism without addressing all of the issues encapsulated in its definition. So Michelle Alexander, who was featured in the 13th, wrote a book called The New Jim Crow. And she says something very profound in the book. She says, in quote, that our understanding of racism is therefore shaped by the most extreme expressions of individual bigotry, not by the way in which it functions naturally, almost invisibly, and sometimes with genuinely benign intent when it is embedded in the structure of a social system. And so essentially, that brings me to what I was saying before, a word with ism 
ism at the end of a word is typically referring to something of a system. Ism, by definition, means a distinctive practice, system, or philosophy. Think of capitalism, fascism, Nazism. They all have ism at the end, and they're denoting a specific system. So a really good definition of racism that we can work with comes from the author David Mura, who says that in order to define racism, you need to, in quote, start with a systemic context, end quote. And so he defines racism as a system through which the power and resources of society are distributed unequally and undemocratically by race. This system functions in all areas of society, politics, economics, the judicial system, the educational system, culture, social relations, religion, etc. Actions and beliefs which support the status quo workings of this system are racist. Racism can be supported both by individuals with conscious or explicit racial bias or by individuals with unconscious or implicit racial biases. Conscious and openly expressed views of racial supremacy need not be present for a person to act in a racially biased manner and thus contribute to racial inequalities, end quote. So that is a mouthful, but nice full definition detailing racism as a system. So now I must ask you, in the United States of America, what is the system that not only founded, but governs America? My answer was white supremacy. In America, white supremacy was what our very constitution was founded on. So what is white supremacy? Very simply put, white supremacy is the belief that white people are superior to other races, especially black people, and that they should therefore dominate society. I mean, that literally describes our nation, that we are making strides. It is a majority of white people who are dominating the political, the economic, the judicial, the educational, the social, the cultural, and religious systems. You mentioned a term I never heard of before. You stated black supremacy in one of your tweets. Can you show me or point to a time in American history where blacks were the dominant majority in all of the systems I just mentioned and they specifically designed it that way because they thought black people were superior? Okay, so now you know the definition of racism I'm working from. Let's go back and answer some of your tweets. You stated, in quote, just because you don't have an agency doesn't negate a person from being racist. A person of color can be a racist to believe otherwise is inherently racist, end quote. So I'm having trouble understanding the first part of this statement. So let's define the word agency. I understand the word in a sociological context to mean the capacity of an individual to act independently and to make their own free choices. So are you saying that just because a person does not have the capacity to act independently, it doesn't negate them from being racist? The sentence doesn't quite make sense to me and perhaps needs more clarity. But the second part, stating that a person of color can be racist, I say not under the American system of white supremacy. The system of racism in America is the system of white supremacy as we just defined. I think any race can be racist if they set up the system we just discussed. I don't believe that supremacy is a new concept, and throughout history and other parts of the world, we saw different races, including people of color, enact their own brand of supremacy. If you follow stories in the Bible, the story of Moses surrounds him freeing the Israelites from slavery, which was enacted under Egyptian supremacy. But here in American history and current day, the brand of racism that is enacted is the system of white supremacy supremacy. It is not black supremacy. It is not Latin supremacy. It is not native supremacy. It's white supremacy. Which leads me to your next statement, that the term white boy is racist simply because you weaponized the term against a troll. You can hold yourself accountable for whatever you want. No one will stop you for that. But simply picking a phrase and weaponizing the phrase doesn't make that phrase racist. That's not how racism works. There is no history in the United States where the term white boy was directly arrived under a system designed to specifically lower the dignity of white people so that every time they heard it, that phrase, they would have a visceral response because that phrase is a reminder that they are not equal. The N-word is directly tied to the system of white supremacy. It was created and used to lower the dignity of black people. It has an established history of doing so. You can point to literature, television, clan rallies that use the N-word to lower the dignity of black people. The term white boy, no matter how you intended it, has no such history. To make this comparison trivializes the painful experiences of black people and people of color. 
So we have seen examples from time to time, like the case of Laquisha Jones, who is a black woman who she beat a 91 year old Latin American man almost to death. And as she was beating him, she shouted something at him like, go back to your country. Now, because of the heinousness of this crime, I do not think anyone would argue that this action was not only monstrous, but extraordinarily racist. And I don't see anything wrong with that. But if we look back at the definition we are using of racism and we confirm that the system system in the United States is white supremacy, then on a technicality, I am not sure that the term racism would apply the best fit as revolting as her actions are. So let's look at another term, because I do think there are many terms that could fit and describe it. Like I said before, they all kind of fit together. So let's look at the term racial animus. Animus, simply put, is a feeling of ill will arousing active hostility. And obviously, if it is racial, then it is due to someone's race. As racism is systemic, animus is often defined and used as hostility between two people. So this would be outside the system, on the individual level. I think someone having racial animus is very much similar to racism, but racial animus might be the more accurate term for what appears to be her racially motivated crime. But I, I don't at all think this is a new concept. You ever hear about certain neighborhoods, you know, one street may have all black families, the next street over is all Latin American families, obviously, they are both minority cultures facing the same oppression from a racist system, they have racial animus or hostility between each other. And the only reason for that hostility is location and race. And that's demonstrated by the racial slurs they hurl back and forth at each other. Yet you wouldn't refer to their tensions as racist towards each other, would you now? They are both minority cultures who in no way, maybe for their own pride or personal satisfaction, they don't benefit from the system of white supremacy while they oppress each other. I think you asked in one of your tweets if black extremists like Candace or even Kanye West are racist. In short, my answer is no. They're not the definition of racism. Even though they have said morally reprehensible things against the black community and people of color, but as people of color themselves, no, they do not benefit from oppressing other people of color. All they are doing is willingly oppressing themselves in the long run. Look at the black Republican female who served in Utah, Mia Love. She voted with Trump 96% of the time, and many people called her out for participating in the system of white supremacy that oppresses black and brown communities. When she criticized the president and lost re-election, Trump taunted her and she pretty much got tossed away. Her willingness to help the system of supremacy ultimately backfired and ended up hurting her in the end. The same happened with Omarosa, but I wouldn't categorize them as racist, and this is not a new phenomena. There will always be blacks and people of color who either through manipulation or willfulness will be recruited and exploited by those in the system of white supremacy. Dr. King's very own photographer and friend, who was a black man, actually turned out to be an undercover FBI informant. He betrayed Dr. King, and we all know how that turned out since Dr. King was assassinated. In fact, you can say that he betrayed black people in America as a whole, since he not only participated in racism during Jim Crow through the surveillance with the FBI, but it led to the assassination of its greatest leader. But the definition, as horrible as it is, does not amount to him being racist. He doesn't benefit benefit from this system and ultimately he oppressed himself. They said in the 13th documentary that Fred Hampton was surrounded more by undercover informants that were black than his own friends. So this is not a new concept, which brings me to why I suggested you watch the 13th. Well, as even you had said, it was an excellent documentary, really, really powerful, but more so it lays out the system of racism in America very beautifully. From the start of our constitution to current day Trump administration, it's very important to note, did you catch the elaborateness and how intricate the system of white supremacy in America works. The documentary begins by stating the Constitution was engineered to enslave black people. Once they could not enslave black people, they created a legal loophole in the 13th Amendment to criminalize blacks so they could be re-enslaved. And the system looks for new ways to continue to enslave and oppress black people. Michelle Alexander touched on this. She said the system creates new iterations. They discussed it didn't just appear out of nowhere, but it is a centuries long historical process. So you just can't take words and apply them to the system and decide, oh, my intent was
was racist, thus it's racist. No, show us where it is tied to a system through centuries long historical process. They laid out how language fits into the system, but they said something really profound in the opening of the doc, that essentially history doesn't just happen, that if you are white, you share in the history of your ancestors and what they chose. But if you are black, it is not a choice. Blacks do not have a current or historical choice in the system of racism. We do not benefit from it, even if we choose to participate in it. Therefore, we cannot technically be racist under it. Now we asked you several times to provide your definition of racism and you have not done so. We also asked for you to give a definition of black supremacy and examples of black supremacy in America and you still have not. Now that we provided our understanding of racism, please provide answers to when and where you know of a time in history where blacks ever had supremacy in the United States and why according to your definition of racism, it is racist to say Say that no, black supremacy is not even a concept here in the United States. Little disclaimer, the system of white supremacy is literally designed so that that never happens and thus blacks cannot be technically racist under the system of white supremacy. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Millennial Edition and I look forward to engaging with you all soon.